ready to witness the final two cars travel the last quarter mile. Now... The grand opening ceremonies of the National Corvette Museum in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Just across the street from the Chevrolet Corvette assembly plant. Several thousand Corvettes, spanning the 40 plus years of its production, have been driven by dedicated owners from all 50 states to Bowling Green to take part in this unique event. Special guest speakers who have earned distinction from their association with this classic American sports car address the large audience gathered in front of the freshly completed building. To commemorate the 42nd anniversary Inside this $15 million museum complex, automobiles and exhibits trace the history of what has long been called America's only true sports car. And since its birth in the early years of the 1950s, the Corvette has faithfully followed an evolutionary path, firmly entrenched in not only sports car performance, but uninhibited style as well. And an automotive universe which many times has been saturated with lookalikes and wannabes. This is a look back at some of the men who helped to create and preserve the styling magic of the Corvette. And the recollections of some of those men who played sizable roles in this all-American success story. And how the talents and passions of enormously gifted designers and free spirits blazed dramatic trails toward visual excitement through the medium of automotive sculpture. It is a tale of agreement and conflict, of lucky guesses and unlucky turns of fortune, of bold planning and bold planners, who shared a common passion for cars that provided more than common transportation with uncommon design and flair. The Corvette, reflections of the style makers. Sports motoring was an idea that took shape almost as early as the creation of the automobile itself. Soon after intrepid manufacturers began fashioning primitive horseless carriages before a curious public, daring young sportsmen removed the fenders, doors, and windshields of these clattering inventions to decrease their weight and tweaked their engines to increase their power, a formula that to this day remains the primary method of creating a sports car. By the 1940s, the sports car industry was almost exclusively a European entity, with names like MG, Mercedes-Benz, and Jaguar producing small and large-bore sports machines, which proved successes both as exhilarating road cars and international race cars. As the 1950s unfolded, America was slowly opening its eyes to the possibility of enjoying the sports car experience. Although several smaller U.S. auto builders, such as Crosley, Kaiser, and Curtis, would gain limited success as sports car producers, the big three, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler, had yet to launch a serious push into the sports car arena. But soon, change was in the wind, thanks to the increasing popularity in America of a British two-seater that had captured the hearts and minds of sports car devotees. I believe the, the real thrust was the, the, uh, the flow of the European cars coming into this country, particularly in racing events. Certainly the Jag 120 was a, a very key car uh, in in that it uh, really evoked a lot of excitement. It was a high performance car for its, for its time. Fairly low cost. And uh, as the, the, uh, the road racing started to catch on, if you will, sports car racing of, of, its, of its day, seemed to be a natural fit for, uh, for Chevy. And I, I think Jag had a uh, considerable uh, amount of influence on the, uh, on the car. Not in the design, but I think in the general, general layout. You know, inline, uh, two-seater, uh, just made, made a lot of sense. Other forces were also in motion that produced those first imperceptible steps that would lead to the creation of the Corvette. 
In early 1952, the needs of an American military leader conjoined with the emerging sports car fascination shared by two men at General Motors. Chevrolet's chief of engineering, Ed Cole, and the legendary director of design at GM, Harley Earl. The car came about uh, because of the Korean War. Uh, General Curtis LeMay, he returned from the Korean War triumphant, and he used to kid his pal, Ed Cole, gee, you know, my boys are coming home, they've got nothing to play with. Overseas, they've had these TRs and these MGs and these, and these funny cars. And, why the hell don't you guys make something for low money, twenty, you know, twenty-eight hundred dollars, that kind of money, and give my boys something to play with? That's how it really came about. Harley Earl wanted to, to build a sports car, an American sports car, and previously he had done a, a car called the La Saber, which was a sports car, but it was a you know big Luxo sports car, and, uh, and also a, a Buick XP three hundred, and so the Corvette kind of fell in as a smaller, uh, a smaller, you know more sporty car aimed at uh, competing with the Jaguar XK120. Harley Earl is a familiar name to anyone who has followed the winding path of style and innovation that traces back to General Motors as early as the mid-1920s. Earl was brought to General Motors in 1927 after cutting his design teeth in California creating stunning coachwork for affluent clientele who wanted one-of-a-kind automobiles. Earl would design Cadillac's first LaSalle shortly after arriving at GM, and would go on to become the head man at their prestigious art and color studios. Standing over six feet and possessing the headstrong confidence and flamboyant style of a born success, he would take personal charge of the design team that would give the newly conceived sports car its visual personality. He brought in a team of, of uh, designers and he gave a fellow by the name of Robert McLean a clean sheet of paper and said, develop a sports car, um, but use existing components. They used a passenger car frame, they used an inline six-cylinder truck engine with a, with a different set of carburetors on it. So he had a clean sheet of paper, but not really. And uh, a fellow by the name of Claire McKeegan, who was the head of design later on in life, worked on the Corvette from 1953 through 1958, and he worked with McLean to, to, to make it what it was. They had various designs. There was a car called the Darren, the Kaiser Darren, which was fiberglass. They dearly wanted to make it fiberglass because at that time they had seen some of the things that could be done with fiberglass. The ease of repair, the lightness uh, isn't going to rust out. So they were very proud of this, this shot to make it out of fiberglass. But the intent was to do that just for the beginning, just for the first few cars. While the decision to use fiberglass met with little objection, Harley Earl was faced with a daunting challenge. The final design upon completion would have to be approved by several layers of GM management. And Earl planned to unveil the new sports car to the buying public within a matter of months at the 1953 GM Motorama in New York City. This is where consumer reaction to new concepts under consideration for production was carefully measured. The design team would have to work fast and just as importantly satisfy the wants of Harley Earl, who had to thoroughly believe in a design concept if it became necessary for him to fight for it. As far as the design of the car is concerned, Harley Earl ruled with kind of a, a tight fist. It was Mr. Earl to everyone. It was always Mr. Earl. He was a, a very large, big, boisterous man. And it was, he required a great deal of, of uh, uh, politeness when you were talking to him. It was Mr. Earl. And if there was any controversy, it was well back in the ranks so that he never heard it. If he said it was going to be fiberglass, then it was good enough for them. And he liked the design, that was good enough for them. His good friend, Ed Cole, who was the engineering genius at that time, decided that there's a lot of things they could do with it. They put Bob McLean on the, on the, on the case. Robert McLean, a Caltech graduate and coincidentally a sports car enthusiast, was given the job of creating the initial design of the Corvette. McLean ignored the traditional practice of drawing up a new car design from the firewall or cowl outward to locate the wheels, engine, and passengers. Instead, 
On a large drafting table, he began with the rear axle center line and designed the car from the back to the front. Design veterans in the GM studio were mystified and told him flatly that doing it that way was impossible. McLean went ahead and did it anyway. When Harley Earl first saw McLean's finished drawing, he asked the young designer, is that how the Jaguar and MG are laid out? When McLean replied yes, Earl said, well, that's how we'll do it. In April of 1952, the Corvette received the first of several unveilings to General Motors middle management, while the company's very highest executives would see it sometime later. The first group included engineering chief Ed Cole, and what they had seen impressed them immediately. And with the 1953 GM Motorama rapidly approaching, Ed Cole's boundless enthusiasm for the Corvette inspired Earl and his team of designers and technicians to throw themselves into the Corvette project with even more energy. The design of the interior was handled by designer Joe Shemansky. The refining of the shapes and contours of the bodywork was the responsibility of designer Claire McKeegan. All in preparation for the final review that mattered the most by GM's uppermost management, including GM President Harlow Curtis and Chevy General Manager Thomas Keating. Harley Earl anticipated a favorable response to the new design, hoping that regular Corvette production could begin immediately following the Motorama. When Curtis and the other top GM officers finally saw the Corvette mock-up for the first time, the car was received with the kind of unmitigated endorsement that Earl and the Corvette team had fully expected. A unanimous decision was reached to proceed with a Motorama Corvette. It would be presented to the public in January of 1953. It derived into a show car, and it was called the 53 Motorama Corvette. And that, was, incidentally, was one of the few, in fact, I think only, Motorama show car that went directly right into production. And it was a sleek, you know, white, pearl white, red interior, so it was a real neat car. In 1953, my dad was a real car enthusiast. Unfortunately, it wasn't Chevrolet or Corvette, it was Studebaker. He bought a new Studebaker every year. But he did like to go to the auto shows, and we went out to New York to the Motorama. And I saw the unveiling of the 53 Corvette. Of course, any 10-year-old boy at that time, that's you know, Mickey Mantle and everything else all rolled into one. I was starry-eyed and I absolutely fell in love with the car. Um, at the age of 10, you didn't care if it was all power and made lots of noise or if it was just what it was. It was just a beautiful car. It was something nobody had seen before and I decided that I had to have a Corvette. Harley Earl had expected the car to be a sensation, and it was. However, he had serious concerns about keeping the car priced affordably, especially for college students who were buying low-cost MGs and Austin Healy's. One of the more pricey components of the new Corvette was the six-cylinder production Chevy engine, which had undergone some power-enhancing changes. It was modified. It had three, uh, three carburetors uh, instead of the single uh, side draft, it had three side draft uh, carburetors. And it, uh, I believe it had a higher lift uh, camshaft. I think it had 150 horsepower, and I think that the regular Chevy engine of that, that year was probably 95 to 100 horsepower. So it was fairly heavily modified and uh, very torquey. And as you, as you know, those, those engines of, uh, uh, were extremely durable and reacted very nicely to modifications. So it, it had the, the, the basic fundamentals of a high performance engine, although, albeit, you know, low tech uh, push, push rod engine, uh, it still did quite well. It was coupled to a uh, power glide transmission, so it was kind of limited as far as its true performance uh, capability. After a total corporate investment of between $55 and $60,000 and a successful New York debut, approval for production was given. The Corvette would join the Chevrolet lineup. Its price, about $2,800. On June 10, 1953, only five months following its debut appearance at the New York Motorama, the first production Corvette rolled from the assembly line in Flint, Michigan. 
Soon, Corvettes would be produced at a new assembly plant in St. Louis, Missouri. Its lightning-fast journey from mock-up to showroom evidenced itself when the assembly crew attempted to turn on such electrical items as the lights, radio, and horn. None of them worked. With an all-fiberglass body, the car would need separate ground wires to complete vital electrical circuits, unnecessary in vehicles with metal bodies. And despite a design that hit a home run with the buying public, several factors worked in unison to keep the Corvette from becoming a major sales success in its initial year. And opinions differ on what those factors were. This is where uh, I have to be careful because I can, I can get some of my friends out in Detroit rather upset. But Chevrolet botched it up royally. They made a big mistake in marketing with the car. They took the car out on the Motorama shows, and at the Motorama in New York alone, they had over 7,000 people who were ready to sign on the dotted line, said, if you make it, we'll buy it, etc. Instead, they decided that, that they had to market the car and get it out there and get it before the public's eye. So people like Joe E. Brown, the, the, the old comedian, got one. Or the DuPont family got two or three. John Wayne got one. And it was that kind of a situation. You had to really be someone to get a car. Well, by 1954, the public had kind of lost interest. And the car wasn't the best in the world. You know, it, it was a true roadster. It had side curtains. It didn't have crank-up windows until 1956. So consequently, the cars should have come with a bar of ivory soap and a towel. They leaked very, very poorly. Uh, Joe Pike used to tell a story about going on a trip and having to bail out the side part the compartment of the car. First and foremost, it was the first fiberglass car of that, you know, that high a volume. And, uh, you know, the line rate was uh, very slow. It was a new technology. It was a fairly simple car. Ford was, was coming on with the, uh, the Ford Thunderbird in 55, and I think, you know, that people may have anticipated uh, that car, you know, thinking, well, if it's Ford, it'll have a V8, and Chevy had a, uh, had a six. And it was, it was a, uh, a, a true sports car. I mean, it w wasn't very watertight, and it wasn't that comfortable to drive, and it was, you know, built on a modified truck chassis, so some of the truck qualities were still in, in the car. You gotta remember that the, the size of the market was extremely small. You know, people uh, in the early 50s, uh, the idea of driving a small two-passenger sports car, there weren't a lot of people that were, were ready for that. That's a pretty bold statement back back in the 53, 54. So uh, it took a while for the, the whole market to kind of get going. And I'm sure, like everything else, uh, it was fairly low cost as a low volume car, but it was still probably fairly, uh, fairly expensive. And it was, in fact, a Chevrolet Corvette. And people would, it's a Chevrolet, and they want whatever it was, $3,000 or whatever it was at the time. You know, it was probably fairly expensive. In a car with such sporting pretensions as the Corvette, style and performance would play critical roles in determining its success in the real world. Two men were about to take center stage in what would become the beginning of a vertical leap in Corvette image and execution. One man, a gifted designer, the other, an equally brilliant engineer. Billy Mitchell, who had joined General Motors two decades previously, had been groomed from the earliest to serve as Harley Earl's heir apparent. Zora Arkas Duntov, a Belgian-born and Berlin-educated engineer with vast experience in the engineering and setup of sports cars, joined Chevrolet in May of 1953. As the Corvette began to evolve, these men would guide each step of that process with conviction and passion. During the mainstream years of Corvette, when Corvette made its name, and, and of course it's lived off that name and still does, I believe, today, during that, that period of time, of course, it was Bill Mitchell and, and Zora Duntoff. Zora Duntoff, who today refer, is referred to as the father of the Corvette. Uh, of course, Zora is 86 years old. Bill Mitchell passed away in 1987. Uh, I think Mitchell and Duntoff used to go head to head, but in a friendly way. Mitchell would claim uh, vigorously that it was my styling that sells the car, and Duntoff would say, no, 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 of course not. It's my performance that sells the car. 
in reality, I, I think they're both right. But I think they had a friendly rivalry. I think they realized that one was dependent upon the other. Uh, today, you might not get either of them to say that if both were alive, but I think that's the way it was. Duntov's role within the Corvette project was clear-cut. His expertise in the realm of high-performance automobiles would add a dimension of speed and handling to the Corvette that was becoming painfully apparent in its absence. In a letter to Morris Ollie in Chevrolet Research and Development in December of 1953, Duntov strongly urged Chevrolet to step up its production of performance parts for Chevrolet vehicles. He observed that many owners of Corvettes would be racing them, and without sufficient power, Chevy would lose valuable product image. He concluded that too many Corvette buyers would prepare their cars for racing by putting a Cadillac in it. While Duntov sparked GM's interest in racing, Billy Mitchell's design staff was busily conceiving styling upgrades for the Corvette, which had remained largely unchanged both in style and power output during its first three years of production. Several design studies based on the 1953 Corvette were proposed for production to help broaden the Corvette's market base, but none of them gained corporate approval. One was a Corvette station wagon. Well, I really think that those styling cars were closer to reality than anybody realizes. Uh, I think they were killed because of the poor sales of the, of the Corvette itself. But I think it was a niche car. I think it was uh, who bought the Corvette, who was going to buy the Corvette. It was the guy that thought a little differently than the other guy. In 53, that would have been the fellow who perhaps wore the, the plaid sport jacket with the leather elbows and smoked a pipe uh, rather than the conventional black suit, white shirt, skinny necktie. Uh, so why wouldn't it make sense that if that guy were looking for a station wagon from mom, that he might not buy something a little different? So I think, they had a, I think they had a plausible idea, but I think the poor sales of the car itself killed it all. The Corvette was now headed into a seven-year period of sometimes subtle and other times significant change. Duntov's efforts paid off in 1955 when the newly introduced 265 cubic inch Chevy V8 was approved for the Corvette. While the shape of the Corvette was also undergoing careful revisions to keep pace with its growing popularity. The 53, 54, 55 were the same body. 56 was a, a, a new body and uh, Personally, I think it's one of the prettiest of all Corvettes. In 1956, when they finally came about uh, uh, to, to, to update the car and, and to make an attempt to make it something a little bit different, uh, and they had the side codes and the crank-up windows, and, and then, of course, the V8 had, had been settled in for some time, three-speed transmission hit the ground instead of that power glide transmission. It was no longer a boulevard cruiser. Now it was a racy car. Now it was the car that you could drive during the week and take out and race on the weekends and win. And that style uh, remained in 57, and of course you got the four-speed transmission and you added fuel injection. It was the first time that you had uh, the same horsepower as you had cubic inches, 283, 283. So you don't want to change what wins, although in 58, uh, the, the, the cars in 58, the, the Buicks, the Chevrolets, the Oldsmobiles, I think that was the year they played pin the chrome on the donkey. And everything was chromed and everything was, was changed. So you had the louvered washboard hood, uh, you had the, the two trunk irons down the back and so forth, and it was the first year of the double headlights. But still, again, minor changes. If you looked at the car from the side, you didn't see a huge change. And that stayed through until uh, uh, 1961. 61 and 62 remained uh, the same. Uh, and they, they were building toward what they were going to build. The Q car was actually designed in 1959, which later became the Stingray. The rear half of the 1961 and 62 Corvettes were taken almost directly from the Q car design study. It was only one of several Corvette concept exercises that Billy Mitchell's design staff and Zora Arcus Duntov's engineering crew teamed up on during the 1950s. After competing at Sebring, Pebble Beach, and other road racing events across the country with varying degrees of success, along with top speed record runs on the sands of Daytona, the Corvette was now building a genuine performance image. But racing Corvettes, by and large, looked like standard production Corvettes. 
In 1956, the Corvette SR2 was built as a clear attempt to design a racing-only Corvette. The SR2 was easy to identify thanks to its rear dorsal fin. Ironically, it would see not only racing duty, but street use and car show appearances as well. The Corvette SS, or XP64, was another competition-inspired Corvette built in 1956. Two were constructed, a development mule and an actual race-prepared car. The Corvette SS was heavily influenced by the D-Type Jaguar, and was built specifically to compete in the 12 Hours of Sebring and 24 Hours of Le Mans in 1957. Mitchell's XP700 would predestine several of the styling changes to be seen on the 1961 and 62 Corvette. And in 1959, the Corvette Stingray Racer was built as a personal project of Billy Mitchell. Larry Shinoda, who would ultimately play a strong role in the production Stingray in 1963, created the striking lines of the Stingray Racer. Mitchell was a great fan of auto racing, and after purchasing one of the Corvette SS chassis from GM with his own money, he saw to the construction of this revolutionary race car. How the Stingray came about was there was a, the Corvette SS. It was a car designed to to race at Le Mans. And this was also something that Harley Earl was pushing pretty heavy. And uh, the car was a beautifully designed car. Uh, it was pretty much finished when I got to General Motors in 56. So uh, I, I had uh, very little to do with it other than uh, I think I designed some louvers that went around the exhaust, exhaust pipes and I did uh, some sketches around the headrest which was sort of a bullet-shaped object. And uh, I did a good part of the design work on a, a glass canopy or plexiglass canopy because the car had to have a top. The car ran and its only race was uh, at Sebring, Florida. The mule ran really good. So then the ban on racing came and uh, everything had to cease. And the mule chassis was laying around uh, Bill Mitchell talked Ed Cole into selling uh, him the chassis for one dollar and he privately was going to race it. I worked on it but I worked on it off-site and we did the body down, down in the basement. Uh, a couple other designers that probably have never really been uh, given too much credit. Uh, Pete Brock who did the Cobra Daytona Coupe and a fellow named Chuck Pullman they did the original design work uh, on the Stingray sports race car. Uh, Mitchell had come back from some European show and made a quick left-handed sketch on an envelope with a, a strong body line and a couple little blips. And he says, uh, something like this, fellas. So they, you know, they kind of slicked it all up. And uh, so they did the clay model, and uh, and then suddenly then he got the chassis. It was my job then to to take it from from their model uh, and make it into the race car, which campaigned in 1959 as uh, the Stingray. It didn't say Corvette on it anywhere. We towed it around with a 59 El Camino pickup truck on an open trailer, and. Uh, I was pit crew, you know, designer, mechanic, you name it. It was essentially, it was a car that was uh, developed with, uh, with Sora Duntoff and um, Bill Mitchell. And uh, he uh, uh, developed uh, the vehicle. He wanted to take it racing. At that time, there was a corporate edict, there will be no racing for General Motors products. And Bill said he'd campaign the car himself, and he got Dr. Dick Thompson to, to drive the vehicle. And that vehicle was heavily influenced by JAG, uh, the C and D uh, JAG, uh, Le Mans cars. Bill uh, had his thoughts on the way the car wanted to look, 
and uh, Zora had his thoughts with well, the way he thought the car wanted to uh, perform relative to its aerodynamic uh, capabilities and the two uh, had some interesting discussions over that but uh, eventually I think Bill bought the car and campaigned the car under his own uh, resourcefulness and essentially then I think he sold it back to General Motors but that car really had a significant uh, uh, part to play in Corvette's history. That was the, the foundation for the 63 production Stingray. In fact, we still have the original racing Stingray in our internal uh, collection here, and it's, uh, it's still a fantastic automobile. I had a chance to drive it for the first time uh, last year. After being here 30 years, I had an opportunity to drive the vehicle. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, it is a race car. It's pretty, it's pretty rough. But it is an, just a wonderful, wonderful machine. The, the, it's a great car. The Stingray racer that Bill Mitchell designed and the production Stingray are clones. There's some refinements. Of course, you can't take a raw race car and turn it into a production car, but the heritage and the, and the lines are there. Fortunately, by 1963, when, when Chevrolet had looked at a, at a whole new series of automobiles and the Corvette was to be something really special, independent rear suspension, and uh, all the, the niceties that uh, came about, it was now to be an all-out sports car. And you had, on the styling and design end of it, you had Bill Mitchell, who was very proud of that car, and the Corvette was his car. He had taken it under his wing some time before. He brought Larry Shinoda in to clean up the design of the 63 and to work on the, on, the, on the Stingray series. And you had Zora, who by that time had pretty much a free hand as to what he wanted to do with the power of the car. So the 63 was truly a special car. And by that time also, Dr. Dick Thompson, the flying dentist from, from Washington, D.C., who made himself so well known in 56 by, by getting rid of his MGs and, and switching over to Corvettes. Well, by now he was a household word. People who didn't even know much about sports cars and racing knew who Dick Thompson was and knew what the Corvette was doing out there. My involvement was to take uh, the Stingray race car design and turn that into a production car, which was really not, you know, not a real easy task. Uh, and it turned out I was the only designer in the studio, and I pretty much reported directly to Bill Mitchell. He, uh, Bill would say, uh, uh, you know, too many cooks will ruin the stew. And he says, so he, the place was off limits to everybody. A fellow that uh, went to Porsche and was the chief designer there for 21 years, Tony Lapine also was uh, working in the studio with me uh, as an engineer. And when the first models were finished uh, in fiberglass for the board of directors meeting, uh, the car had the split window the split was a little bit narrower, but uh, there was a hatch for the whole back end opened up. And uh, if you look carefully at some of the early pictures, you can see uh, the scoops that went in the front front fender were back in the rear fender on the, that first model. And uh, on the Roadster version, there were a whole series of dumb-looking louvers down along the rocker that uh, Bill Mitchell wanted. And, you know, and he was a boss, so you did uh, whatever surface entertainment he asked for. Back in those days, it was nothing to, uh, to see the new cars at the dealership showrooms well in, in advance of, of opening day, but covered up with a sheet or covered up with a car cover. And uh, anybody with gasoline in their blood used to have to go to the dealerships and snoop around out back after they'd closed or peek in through windows or go places you shouldn't be and try to see what was there. And uh, I saw a midnight blue 63 coupe uh, well before it was supposed to have been announced to the public. And boy, I would have sold my soul at that time to, to own a 63 Corvette. It just had that, that style that uh, uh, the other cars didn't have. Uh, had some edges and had some excitement in the, in the shapes and it was you know, perfectly executed. And it had an American character to it in contrast to the Ferraris and the uh, the uh, Maseratis and the Aston Martins and so on and so forth. And those were also gorgeous cars, but it just had an American characteristic to it. So when the 63 car came out, it had all those qualities of the race car, and uh, it was a, an extremely uh, exciting car in 
if you follow the, the mark at all, you know those, those cars of that vintage are highly sought after and they just, they just look spectacular. They're very, very lean, they're very agile. Uh, of course, the 63 with the, the split window, uh, you know, people at first didn't like it and they dropped it. Obviously, you, know, you talk about reaction to the customer's needs, you know, the 64 it was gone. But the, uh, uh, the car was well received, you know, the integrated, the doors flowing into the upper and the very tiny upper and the exciting fender shapes looking out over the hood. Very, very exciting car. To, uh, to sit in and to, to drive it, it, it really, you know, got your juices flowing. You haven't even started it up yet. I mean, just sitting in the car got your juices flowing. So, you know, once you uh, got underway, it was a pretty exciting uh, automobile. As I, this story was told to me, Bill Mitchell wanted the split window. And Zora was very much against it. It came out in 63 as a split window, and it went away in 64. Bill Mitchell's comment was, yes, it was a safety consideration, and Zora was right on that one. And 64, it was gone. The thing about a Corvette, it's not only an emotional automobile, it generates a lot of emotion, but if you're involved with the development of the car, it gets to be very, very emotional. and the, Bob Vogelai, who was the chief body engineer for the Corvette for years and remained a good friend, he, uh, he often said there's two kinds of people, people that <clears throat> want to stay as far away from the Corvette as possible or they want to get in there and do your job for you because it, it, it evokes that kind of uh, excitement. Well, you can well understand with Bill Mitchell, who was a very, very strong-willed, very uh, dynamic uh, designer, and uh, you know, he's just—he was a just a powerful, powerful individual. And Zora, in his own right, an extremely talented, powerful uh, engineer with a, a racing pedigree of, of Le Mans and driving for uh, for Porsche and so on and so forth. And you know, these two, these two. Uh, Giants getting together over something as as exciting as a Corvette. You know, I'm sure, and I wasn't wasn't there, but I've I've talked to Zora uh, over the years, and still uh, consider Zora a very uh, very good friend. Uh, tells me some of the experiences, the arguments he had with with Mitchell, and Mitchell got his way, or Zora got his way, or whatever, and talked about why that was the way it was, and. And you can just imagine the, the fur flying. We have a museum in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And we named the street out in front of it after Zora. And we, we decided to call it Duntoff Way rather than Duntoff Drive. The reason for that is because Zora always got his way. The 1963 through 1967 Corvettes, known to enthusiasts as the Mid-Year Series, underwent subtle design changes in those five model years. In 1963, for the first time in its history, Chevrolet would build over 20,000 Corvettes. The number would grow to over 27,000 in 1966, dropping slightly in 1967 to just under 23,000. During this period, performance reflected the horsepower wars that punctuated the muscle car era of the 1960s. From 360 horsepower with 327 cubic inches and fuel injection in 1963 to 435 horsepower with 427 cubic inches and three two-barrel carburetors in 1967, the mid-year Corvettes were not only breathtaking to look at, but breathtaking to drive. The car is a rocket. You know, obviously, you know, while all the all the design work is being uh, developed. You know, Zora is really doing some great uh, powertrains. They developed the uh, the L88, which was the famous uh, racing engine. Those engines were extremely powerful. I, th I think the advertised horsepower was was down here, and the actual output was considerably higher. The Ford Thunderbird had moved from a two-seat to four-seat configuration in 1958. 
By 1963, the Corvette Brain Trust was toying with the idea of producing a larger Corvette to compete head-on with the T-Bird. The idea, however, was soon put on permanent hold. It was 10 inches longer. It looked quite awkward because uh, the roof was kind of bulky and uh, it had very long doors. Uh, Ed Cole was showing the car to, uh, showing it in, a, I believe, a 58 Thunderbird, a uh, four passenger. And uh, uh, Jack Gordon, who's the president, says, uh, Ed, uh, tell me the truth. Can, can a human being sit in that back seat? He says, of course, M Mr. Gordon. And they opened this, the right door and got him in. And he was kind of all, he was, he didn't want to get in, but then he finally climbed in. They closed the door and he kind of motioned he wanted to get out and it was a real hot, steamy day. Uh, I think it was some, it was, it was probably er, early May, but it was a real hot, humid day. And they got the door open and the damn seat back wouldn't release. And so they, they had to finally tear the seat out and got him out of it. And he's all huffing and puffing and madder than hell. And uh, that was the end of the car. But if the mid-year Corvettes solidified themselves as style and performance champions that won almost unanimous praise from all quarters, then the next generation Corvette, which debuted in 1968, truly had a tough act to follow. And the competition had been stepped up, not only by Ford's Mustang, but Chevy's own Camaro, cars with formidable performance and strong sports car images. Billy Mitchell's design team, including Larry Shinoda, Jerry Palmer, and another extremely talented designer, Henry Haga, provided imaginative and thought-provoking themes and continued to conceive design studies through the 60s that took the Corvette into radical new areas of style. Billy Mitchell was eager to create a new look for the Corvette that would distance it from its more conservatively styled competitors. The Shark, or Mako Shark One, was one concept that brought heavily futuristic styling touches to the table. Although never slated for production, its paint job provided for an unusual challenge to the Corvette designers. Bill Mitchell had actually uh, caught this shark off of Bimini, and he said it was a Mako Shark, and I think it really was a blue shark, but uh, here nor there, but. Uh, and he had it mounted uh, where the head was cut on a bias angle, so it came off the board, and uh, it was beautiful. And so when we were going to do the first uh, Mako shark, he wanted it painted to look like the shark. So I took and painted uh, myself with my own airbrush uh, a bar relief stingray model that they had uh, sculpted. And there was actually no blue. It was it went from so black into a dark, dark blue to the body wide line. And then from that point on below, it went into shades of silver into white. And so there was no powder blue. The paint shop couldn't match it. They came over and borrowed Mitchell's mounted shark. They took and painted the shark to match her paint panel and then showed him the paint panel in the car. And uh, when he saw the, the two together, he said, boy, you guys really did a job. He was quite pleased. I don't, he never realized that they had painted a shark. In April of 1965, the Mitchell team unveiled a striking harbinger of Corvette's next design heading. And its spectacular shape sent shockwaves across the globe. The car was the Mako Shark II. There's a lot of uh, harmony between nature and great design. A lot, a lot of interaction. Uh, and the shark, obviously, is, is one of those things that just evokes beauty, but yes, it, it has the element of brutality associated with it, with its movement, the shape of the, of the, of the thought, the, the fuselage or the fins, or however you want to describe it. If you look at a Corvette, particularly the, uh, the 63, it had some of that. And then Bill, uh, and I think Larry, Larry was involved with, uh, with these cars, uh, Larry Shinoda, uh, started a series of uh, show cars. 
with the, uh, the Mako Shark, which is really based on a 63 type of design. When they did Mako Shark 2, they really heightened the, the wheel arches and they pulled the body in very tight. And in plan view, it had a very severe wasp waist to a Coke bottle shape. Then that became the, uh, the brand character for Corvettes for, uh, for years to come. So those cars were done and that became the, uh, again, the foundation for the 68 car. The Corvette design team would extend the envelope of the Mako Shark concept with the Manta Ray, a design study which Corvette enthusiasts almost unanimously hoped would find its way into production. When it did not, many were disappointed. But the issue of style was only one controversy that greeted the 1968 Corvette. Although Chevrolet produced over 28,000 Corvettes in 1968, more than in any previous year, some insiders at GM quietly admitted that the car had come to the market too soon, and the Corvette was playing to a tough audience. Early customers were dissatisfied with the quality control and attention to detail on their new Corvettes. One critic in particular was especially unimpressed until an incident during testing at the GM Proving Grounds softened his opinion. Even Zora complained about it, you know, the, the Coke bottle shape, because that's what, you know, Mitchell called it, Coke bottle. And uh, after the production car was done, I think it was maybe a year or so after it was out, and Zora had been testing, he'd been out at the Proving Grounds uh, running at real high speed, and he had to, to a tire failure, and the car went into the guardrail, and they ran uh, clockwise so the driver would be on the outside next to the wall. And uh, Zora says, "Aha, uh -huh. Coke bottle saves Zora. When he hit the wall, it it ground down the sides of the car, <laughs> and until finally the door hit the wall, and it stopped. <laughs> but." You know, had there not been this cold bottle shape, uh, you know, he'd have been right out there on the edge. Uh, he might have got s seriously injured. But it was kind of a funny story that, uh, you know, he finally uh, admitted that uh, Coke bottles did work. <laughs> it was a car that was way before its time. It was a car that, uh, as a matter of fact, it was so far before its time that it really shouldn't have come out in 68. If, if, uh, if people listen to the, some of the stories that are out there, uh, the car was poorly put together in 68. Uh, as a matter of fact, Zora got into a 68 for testing the very first time and, and called Cole and said, we can't put this car in the market. And I think that was one of the first times that he and Mitchell, or certainly one of the many times that he and Mitchell went head to head. The front fender peaks were way too high. Uh, the suspension was too sloppy, etc. But they were interested in getting that swoopiness, that advanced styling out there. I think that somebody far, far removed from the scene had an idea that that car was going to last uh, on into the years. If, if you look at that car, that car changed very little from 68 until it ended in, in, in uh, 82. As the 1970s ushered in new government restrictions and a corporate pullback on factory horsepower, the Corvette took on the role of a sports touring car and shifted away from the hairy-chested image of the mid-year cars. Zora Arkis Duntov would retire from GM in 1975. Billy Mitchell retired two years later, ending what many consider to be, at times, the most exhilarating and, at other times, the most combative automotive partnership in history. You got to remember, as with with all with you know those those two uh, gentlemen, obviously got all the the accolades. But there are some tremendously talented people in engineering and design supporting their efforts, and uh, some of those folks are the, the the folks that really made made the car what it is. You know, working with the fellow like Bill Mitchell, he would. He'd give you some direction, and he was left-handed. He'd do some kind of left-handed sketch on a back of an envelope or a, you know, or whatever on a sketch pad, and he'd say something like this. And you'd see some of the pictures they had probably there. Were, one of them, I guess, he was uh, sitting up on in the Stingray sports race car, and he's got on a, a silver car, and there's a aluminum uh, 
you know, a fine ribbed uh, stainless steel door in the background. And he's sitting in there with his pristine, beautiful gray suit. And he's got on a white straw hat. And you know, I think he's got his, you know, he's got that, you know, look that sort of, he used to kind of fancy himself to be sort of James Cagney. In 1978, the 25th anniversary Corvette with its distinctive two-tone silver paint and the Corvette Indy 500 pace car with a striking contrasting black and silver exterior represented two of the decade's few highlights in Corvette design. The collector edition Corvette in 1982 was another attempt to add a different wrinkle to the basic Corvette theme, which had now seen duty from the late 60s through the 70s and into the 80s. New men were coming on board at Chevrolet. The look and layout of the next generation Corvette would rest squarely on the shoulders of men like designer Jerry Palmer and engineering chief Dave McClellan. Corvette concepts which had drawn industry attention such as the mid-engined two-rotor and four-rotor Corvettes powered by Wankel rotary engines, the Reynolds aluminum Corvette built by Reynolds Aluminum as a proposed replacement for the venerable fiberglass Corvette, and the Astrovet, an earlier concept design to promote Astro ventilation in which one piece side glass was used, were all fueling speculation that the new Corvette slated for 1984 production would be the most revolutionary of any previous design. The 1984 Corvette arrived without a rumored mid-engine setup or a drastic change in its powertrain. While some thought it a sensation, in an era of knife-edged exotics and daring flying wedge coachwork, some critics expressed disappointment in the Corvette's conservative statement. Well, you know, they say beauty's in the eye of the beholder. That car is probably one of the safest automobiles on the road. You know, you get into it and are wrapped around by it. Uh, but in terms of styling and design, um, if you really look the car over, it's got a lot of advantages that the other cars don't have at, what, half the price? Um, that car stands up and makes a statement. I would say that there has to have been a master plan. I don't think that Jerry Palmer and the guys, when they designed the car, said, well, you know, we're going to design this for 14 years. I don't think that was the plan, but I think they wanted to get their bang for the buck and get the, you know, the optimum number of sales out of it. Yes, sure, they could have done something different, but what would it have done to price? What would it have done to imagery? I think they did a, a remarkable job with what they were given to work with, and as it evolved, the changes that were made were minimal. Um, again, if you put a, an 84 car next to a 94 car, uh, you, you certainly see the, the similarities. It's the same car. Jerry Palmer continues to play a significant role in the design of the Corvette, along with modern-day designers Wayne Cherry and John Caffaro. The Chevrolet team continues to chart the future course of the Corvette with cutting-edge prototypes like the mid-engined Corvette Indy. Other men have also left their mark in the history of Corvette styling, men like Irv Rabicki, and Chuck Jordan. But it is the imagination and stubborn determination of the Corvette's early gatekeepers. Harley Earl, Ed Cole, Bill Mitchell, Zora Arkus Duntov, and the dedicated visionaries who took concept to completion that made automotive history in a time we shall surely never see again. Their heartfelt commitment to a car that has become a part of the motoring fabric in America and indeed around the world can be easily measured by the devotion and emotion that can only be fully understood from behind the wheel of a Corvette. When the designers of Corvette go to the extremes of looking at little details like, like uh, double tail lights, well, the American public has come to recognize a Corvette because it's got, it's got four tail lights. But when they go to the extreme of, of remembering to build that in, and the emblems look alike, and those type of things, it's important. I think it's important to the, to the designers, it's important to the American public. Corvette is, is, again, a way of life. It's a feeling, and they don't want to lose that imagery. It's an American icon, and, and being so, they have to they walk a delicate to the line. I think they have to keep that imagery. They have to keep that feeling. 
I think the Corvette is 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 something that that fills that 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 little niche in everyone's uh, heart or their their psychic that just the pit of, the uh, the epitome of uh, American driving passion. And if if we didn't have one, I just think we'd all be a lot worse off because of it. I don't know if any other mark could fill the fill the mark of the Corvette. And I really believe that there's something about a Corvette, you know, the, the best that America can, can offer that's second to none. To own a Corvette and to drive a Corvette is like living out a dream. It's just a once of a lifetime opportunity that everybody should experience. It's just a total different driving experience. You can have the baddest day, the hardest day at work, uh, anything that's frustrating, and just get in a Corvette and roll the windows down and start it up and take off and just drive it through a winding, curvy road out in the country and you leave all your troubles behind you. It's just a marvelous experience. I think the Corvette will be with us uh, always in, in some shape or form. I think as long as there are automobile people in the automobile industry, there'll be the Corvette. I think, again, it represents to the American public America. It represents something that you can obtain, something you can shoot for. Uh, what could jeopardize it? Gosh, I don't know. I, I don't see anything replacing the automobile industry. You know, they're talking about people movers and, and uh, high-speed escalators and so on and so forth. That's all nice, and I'm sure we'll see that. But you're still going to see the, the automobile as it is. It, it, I think it'll always be. Um, I don't think anyone pictures themselves getting behind the, the, uh, the wheel of an automobile and just going out in the back road or out in the back uh, way and just having a good time any more than the Corvette owner does. Uh, it's the wind in the face and the, you know, the song on the radio and, and I'm out of the office and I'm away and you can't touch me here type thing. Uh, I think there'll always be the Corvette.